The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. We at Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems welcome you, and thank you for attending our next in the series of educational webinars entitled Basics of Size Reduction, Part 1. Let me point out, if you have a question during this presentation, you may submit your question online. Please refer to the question and answer pane on your screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, we will try to accommodate all of the questions during our question and answer forum. My name is Bill Brown. I am the manager of the Chemicals and Minerals Group at Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems is a division of Hosokawa Micron Group with headquarters in Osaka, Japan. We are the global leader in powder processing equipment manufacturing, employing over 1,500 employees worldwide with production facilities in five countries and 12 research facilities in state-of-the-art test centers. Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems is the North American division of Hosokawa Micron Group, supplying products and services in the chemicals, minerals, food, and pharmaceutical markets. Our brand names include Micro, Alpine, Micron, Briconauta, Majac, Stott, and Vitalair. Our division was founded in 1923 under the name Pulverizing Machinery. We are located in Summit, New Jersey, and have approximately 50 employees and have been part of the Hosokawa Micron Group for 23 years. At this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Rob Voorhees, Vice President and General Manager of Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. Rob has worked in the processing industry for the past 30 years. Rob started, Rob started his career with Microcool Corporation, an air pollution, air pollution control and environmental, environmental company that was acquired, that was acquired by Hosokawa in 1985. He later, he later worked for several years as regional, as regional sales, sales manager for Research Control Corporation. In 1994, he rejoined, he rejoined the Hosokawa Micron Group. Rob, Rob had various, various sales management and management positions and became general, general manager in 1998. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Voorhees, and I will be the presenter for today's webinar. Welcome to part one of our presentation on basic size reduction. The material we will cover is an introduction to the subject and will not cover every type of equipment that may be available in the marketplace today. This presentation is designed to give, introduce you to the basic subject of grinding principles and will give you a broad brush of the equipment used to produce coarse and medium grinds. The overview of basic size reduction today We'll cover the subjects of grinding principles, general machine types and their application, and basic system concepts and system components. There are four basic principles utilized in milling equipment for the purpose of dry particle size reduction. They are shearing or cutting, attrition, compression, and impact. In many cases, a combination of these principles may be employed in any one machine. We will note as we go through the presentation which principles are employed in each machine type. The subjects covered today will be coarse to medium size reduction. For the purpose of defining these categories, coarse size reduction will be defined as particles from approximately one half inch in diameter down to 750 microns or approximately 20 mesh. Medium size reduction will be defined as particles that range from 750 microns down to 50 microns. Fine grinding and ultra-fine grinding, noted in red, will be the topic of our upcoming webinar next month for Basic Size Reduction Part 2. The first principle we will discuss is the principle of shearing. Shearing is defined as cutting or cleaving a particle in two with a sharp blade. This principle is most commonly used in rotary cutting machines called granulators and vertical cutting machines known as guillotines. Shearing action is often required to process materials that are elastic, pliable, or fibrous in nature. nature. Examples are rubber, plastic film, and copper cable. The end result is a relatively coarse particle size. Attrition is the second principle of size reduction we will discuss. Attrition is defined as two particles abrading against each other in opposite parallel planes. Materials that don't fracture easily by impact or compression can be processed using this principle. This grinding principle is used in attrition mills and gap mills. Common applications for the size reduction of various plastics like PVC or polyethylene when much finer particle sizes are required. 
The next grinding principle is that of compression. Compression is defined as pressing of a particle between two solid surfaces. Today's presentation will cover only low pressure compression. The compression principle is employed in many types of size reduction equipment. We will briefly cover today jaw crushers, cone mills, and flake crushers. This principle is best used for soft or friable materials to produce narrow particle size distributions with a limited generation of fine particles. Lastly, we will look at size reduction used the grinding principle of impact. This is probably the most common method employed in milling equipment today. Impact is defined as a solid object moving at high velocity, coming in contact with a stationary particle. The impact principle is employed in two of the machine types we will discuss today, hammer mills and pin mills. Impact is used to achieve the highest fineness possible in these types of machines. Most hard, crystalline, and amorphous particles react well to impact for the purpose of size reduction. The most important aspect of selecting a size reduction method is to know some basic information about the product you want to make and the raw material it is made from. The four basic things you should know is the particle size of the feed material, the material characteristics, the material characteristics which we will discuss in more detail, the required end product particle size, and the required end product particle size distribution. Knowing this information will help you help the equipment supplier to make the equipment selection much easier. It is important to note that based on product characteristics only certain milling technologies may be employed for a given application. Starting a project knowing the basic requirements will result in an economical and trouble-free solution to your powder processing needs. It is also recommended to do a test trial on a pilot scale piece of equipment. Almost all equipment manufacturers offer customers the capability to do in-house test trials. Let's talk about some material characteristics as they are listed here before we go any further. Let's look at the effect of feed size on mill performance. Larger feed material means more residence time in the mill and larger equipment will be required for a given production capacity. Feed size affects feeding methods and feeder selection. For example, air conveying large high bulk density feed to a mill may not be possible and large feed size cannot be introduced to small-scale laboratory and pilot processing equipment. How does bulk density affect performance? Bulk density affects flowability of the product. Feeding can also be affected. Light density materials may flood past the feeder affecting feeding accuracy. There are methods available to determine flood and flow characteristics of materials. Bulk density will also affect the sizing of hoppers and finished packaging. Product cohesivity can cause numerous problems in the milling system. Cohesive and sticky products will build up on mill internals and plug screens used for particle size control. Systems may require the use of high velocity air to keep mill internals clean. Heat sensitive products also require special handling and special system designs. Low melt point materials are sensitive to high energy input mill systems. Heat sensitive products may require cooling in order to efficiently process them. What about product moisture and products with moisture absorbing characteristics? Hydroscopic materials absorb, mo absorb moisture causing buildup and plugging and may require dehumidified air for processing. On the other hand, products containing moisture may allow for high energy processing. The moisture in the product will absorb the heat of grinding providing cooling in the process. Material hardness also needs to be considered when selecting a milling technology. High energy milling may be required to effectively break very hard particles. Hardness may lead to high component wear and increased maintenance, minimizing the selection of equipment for abrasive applications. Special wear protection of mill components may need to be considered. On the other hand, there are fireable materials or materials that fracture easily. High energy input can lead to too many fines generation with very friable materials. Low energy processing may be employed when handling these types of materials. If particle shape is important, keep in mind that impact tends to produce sharp angular par particles. Compression and shear forces tend to produce more rounded particles. And high aspect ratio materials are destroyed by impact forces. You can see that material characteristics play a very large role in machine selection and design. Let's go on to talk about particle size and then different milling technologies. 
We should briefly mention a little bit more about particle size distributions and how to read a particle size distribution curve. This is a graph of cumulative size distribution curve. The shape or steepness of the curve is normally defined by using three parameters. Here they are shown as the D90, the D50, and the D10. The term as shown means that 90% of the particles in this size distribution are less than 38 microns. The D50 is defined as 50% of the particles being less than 18 microns and 10% of the particles being less than 7 microns. In some cases, different top sizes may also be important, such as the D80, the D97, or the D99 percentile. This is a histogram showing a particle size distribution by frequency. In many cases, it may be desired to know the median or mean particle size. The median particle size is defined as the diameter at which 50% of the particles in the distribution are larger and 50% of the particles in the distribution are smaller. The mean particle is defined as the average particle size and is determined by dividing the D75 percentile by the D25 percentile. Shown on this slide is an air jet sieve for measuring particle size. A screen of a particular mesh or micron size is used to establish the percent of material that passes through a particular micron size. The device uses air to sweep the particles through the screen. The process is very controllable and results in a very accurate and repeatable particle size measurement. This is a relatively low cost device to measure particle size and is very easy to use. There are also other methods for measuring particle size that incorporate shaping, shaking principle to perform a similar function. Particle size can be accurately and efficiently measured on this type of device down to 635 mesh or 20 microns. This chart is designed as a very basic selection method for milling equipment when considering end particle size requirements and the hardness of the material to be processed. As you can see, only certain mill types are suited for very hard materials. This is mainly because hardness is also associated with mill wear, and certain milling technologies lend themselves much better to process hard and abrasive materials. As an example, a ball mill system can be much easier to wear protect than a hammer mill with a screen. As you can see from the chart, the mills we will discuss today are mainly used with material hardnesses of less than 4 mohs. Today we'll focus on coarse and medium size reduction categories shown here in blue and green. We will cover generic types of machines including crushers, granulators, cone mills, hammer mills, and pin mills. Please note that there are many sizes and configurations of machines available in the marketplace. We will discuss only a few generic types today, but the discussion should provide you with a general overview of the technologies available. The first piece of equipment discussed for coarse size reduction will be the jaw crusher. These machines are used for pre-sizing materials for the use in the next stage of a process, which is usually further size reduction. Minimum particle size produced is normally in the range of half inch or larger. These machines consist of two counter-rotating shafts. The shafts have hooks, stars, cams, or teeth that are used to break materials as they are drawn in between the rotating shafts. A screen at the underside of the machine housing retains oversized particles and controls the size of the discharge material. They can handle large throughputs and require no ancillary system components. They are mostly gravity fed and processed materials vertically discharged from the machine. This is only one example of a crusher. Machines come in a variety of physical sizes, horsepowers, and materials of construction depending upon the material to be processed and the capacities required. This picture shows a relatively small crusher with a feed opening of approximately 12 by 18 inches. Examples of capacities and materials that can be processed on this size machine are shown here. The principles of compression and shear forces are used on this type of coarse size reduction device. This slide shows a picture of a rotary granulator. The machine consists of a cylindrical rotor assembly with knife edge blades mounted along the axial length of the rotor. In rotation, the blades pass by a stator at zero clearance to generate a shearing force. These machines are used to process bulk materials and film that are difficult to process in impact mills. 
they produce a relatively large particles down to the size of about a quarter of an inch with relatively narrow, narrow particle size distributions. Feed material is gravity fed into the machine and gravity discharged from the machine. Like the crusher, a screen underneath the rotor controls the final product size. When high production capacities are required, an air swept discharge may be used to convey the proximus material away from the granulator. The rotary granulator shown here is an example of a shearing device used primarily for recycling applications. Listed here are common materials that are processed on this type of machine. You can see the application range is very wide and production capacities for the mach these machines can be very large. This is a picture of a conical screen mill used to process coarse and granular particle size distributions. This machine consists of a conical shaped multiple bar rotor assembly as shown here. Positioned inside a 60 degree angle conical screen. At low rotor speeds, particles are pressed by the rotor through the screen. At higher speeds, some impact and shear forces also come into play. Due to the low energy inputs, input, heat sensitive materials and friable products can be easily processed. Various screen types and screen openings control particle top size. The rotor design, the rotor to screen gap, and rotor speed control the generation of fine particles. These types of mills are capable of producing narrow particle size distributions with particle size that range from 5 millimeters down to 150 microns. Conical screen mills are primarily used in the pharmaceutical industry for applications where granular products with narrow size distributions are desired. They are typically used to process active ingredients and excipients. The resultant narrow size distribution improves particle flow and solubility characteristics. Conical screen mills are typically employed after compaction or prior to tableting operations. Another type of screen mill is known as the flake crusher and also known as an oscillating crusher. The difference of this type of machine from a cone mill is that the rotor runs at much lower speeds or oscillates within the screen. The gap is usually not adjustable and due to the lower rotor speeds, end products are coarser and particles are typically no finer than 200 microns. Applications are usually the same as for cone mills. Pictured here is an attrition mill which incorporates the principle of using a parallel force between a particle and a solid object to reduce particle in size. In this case, a pair of serrated rotor, rotating steel discs. A serrated rotating disc is mounted inside of the housing, as shown here. On the door side of the housing is mounted a stationary serrated steel disc. The discs are angular, as you can see here, to allow feed product to enter the grinding zone. The rotating discs abrade the material into smaller particles as the particles centrifugally work their way through the annular gap shown here. The annular gap, the serrated disc design, and the speed of the rotor control the resultant particle size and the throughput capacity of the machine. For the finest grinds, disc gaps down to 20 thousandths of an inch can be used. Here is an enlarged picture showing the conical shape of the rotor and the profile of the serrated rotor discs. A tight annular gap will result in lower throughputs and higher heat integration, but also will produce the finest particles. Shown here are typical applications for this type of mill. While commonly employed for use in plastics applications as shown, attrition mills can also be used for difficult to grind food products such as hard, fibrous grains with shells or hulls. This is a picture of a typical high speed hammer and screen mill that works on the principle of impact. Hammer mill designs consist of a rotor assembly with hammers that rotate inside a cylindrical closed housing. The top of the housing contains a liner where particles are impacted between the liner and the hammers and size reduction takes place. The bottom portion of the housing contains a screen used to control particle size uh, of, 
of the particles exiting the mill. These mills can impart high energy to a particle and are used to produce sharper and finer particle size distributions with a defined top size. Hammer mills can be used for pre-grinding, deagglomeration, and medium to fine grinding depending upon the rotor speed of the machine and the internal grinding elements used. Larger low speed mills with large internal clearances can be used for primary size reduction while smaller high speed mills with tight internal clearances are used to produce much finer particles. This is a cross section of our hammer mill showing the position of the liner at the top of the housing and the screen at the bottom of the housing. Feed screws meter the product into the mill. The function of the liner shown here and the screen are depicted in these two uh, pictures. The multiple deflector liner is used to slow the peripheral motion of the particles and to deflect them into the path of the hammers for maximum particle impact and grinding efficiency. For minimal fines generation, the multiple deflector liner can be changed to a smooth liner which will reduce the impact force in the mill. The function of the screen shown below is to provide particle top size control. Since the particles approach the screen tangentially, a particle sees only a fraction of the total screen opening. Larger particles are deflected back into the grinding chamber while finer particles exit through the screen. Due to this phenomenon, particles, that are, particles are produced that are finer than the screen opening size. Controlling particle size and size distribution can be accomplished in hammer and screen mills by employing a variety of screen types and hammer designs. Let's discuss screen types first. As shown here at the top of the slide, screens can be provided with round hole perforations, cross slot perforations, and herringbone slots. In addition, the sizes of the perforations and slots come in many dimensions. Round hole screens produce the finest grinds, but herringbone and cross slot screens are employed to process sticky or fibrous materials that would otherwise plug a round hole screen. Now let's look at hammer types. Three types of hammers are shown here. The first is the rigid knife type hammer. These types of hammers are use, used at slow speeds to produce coarse and granular grinds with a minimum of fines generation. The second hammer type is the stirrup hammer. These hammers have the most surface area and are used at high speeds to produce the finest particles. The last hammer type is the bar hammer used for coarser size reduction and reduced fines generation with narrow par particle size distributions. Knife hammers are also used on materials that do not respond well to impact. Fibrous materials that need to be cut or shredded work well with knife type hammers. Other parameters that are important to consider that also control the performance of the machine are airflow and rotor speed. Increased rotor speeds results in finest particle size generation. Airflow can affect capacity and it can also be used to control heat generation when processing heat sensitive materials. Hammer and screen mills have a very large processing range. Horsepowers can range from one horsepower laboratory machines up to several hundred horsepower production machines with capacities of several tons per hour. They are often used in cryogenic applications as it is quite easy to inject liquid nitrogen and with externally mounted bearings mechanical operational problems are minimized. Shown here are examples of food products, fine chemicals, and minerals that are processed on hammer and screen mills. The last example we will discuss today is the universal pin mill. The most common design is the single rotating pin disc design with stationary door disc and narrow grinding chamber shown here at the right. This design <coughs> Uh, handles a variety of applications. For special applications, a dual rotating disc design with wide grinding chamber is available, shown here on the left. The wide chamber design is used to process thick materials. It is also used for cryogenic grinding applications. Due to the counter-rotating discs, very high differential tip speeds of up to 200 meters per second can be achieved to produce finer grinds. No screens are used in pin mills to control particle top size. The high speed of the pins generate fine products. 
Tip speeds on pin mills can reach 150 meters per second. The overall particle size distribution generated in a, in a pin mill is much wider than hammer and screen mills due to the lack of top size control. The higher tip speeds are employed to generate finer particle size distributions. A wide variety of grinding elements also make these machines adaptable to a wider range of applications. Shown here are stud disc rotors, swing hammer rotors, rigid hammer rotors, and different grinding tracks with a combination of screens. As with hammer and screen mills previously discussed, these internal elements can be changed to process a variety of materials and will allow the operator to produce a wide range of particle size distributions. In addition to changing grinding elements, the particle size can be controlled by three additional parameters. They are feed rate, rotor RPM, and airflow. Because there is no screen in a pin mill, feed rate has a greater effect on particle size. Increasing the feed rate will result in a coarser particle size, while reducing it will have the opposite effect. Increasing the rotor speed will generate a farting particle size, while reducing the speed will have the opposite effect. And lastly, increased airflow will produce a coarser product, while decreased airflow will produce a finer product. The next two slides present typical applications for pin mills. Shown here are the results of a wide chamber counter-rotating pin mill grinding various spices at ambient temperatures. Under chilled or cryogenic processing conditions, much finer particle sizes can be achieved in this type of mill. For single rotating disc pin mills, this slide shows common results for a variety of fine chemicals. Many of the mill types discussed today require additional incinerary components to allow them to function efficiently and safely. This is especially true for larger production systems using hammer mills and pin mills. In the next few slides, we will discuss a few different system types. We will discuss the basics of gravity systems with and without blower, blowers, once through negative pressure systems, systems designed to handle potentially explosive materials, and closed loop processing systems. Since both pin mills and hammer mills generate airflow, the air generated during the milling process has to be vented from the machine. The most basic machine operation is shown on the left. Material is processed in the mill and gravity discharged into a bulk container. The displaced air is vented through a filter shown to the left of the machine. And trained particles in the airstream are collected in the filter. In the picture on the right, the mill is mounted on a hopper and product is processed in the mill and gravity discharged into the hopper. The displaced air and product are also discharged into the hopper and then flow into a dust collector mounted on top of the hopper. Sometimes a fan will be used to pull a negative draft through the system. Negative pressure systems reduce or eliminate dusting in the atmosphere and result in a cleaner operation. These are two of the most basic and most compact type of mill system operations. The next example is one of a once through negative pressure system consisting of a few more components. Shown in this slide are the major components of this type of system. A product feeder, a feed isolation valve, the mill, a product collector, and an induced draft fan. This is a basic low pressure air conveying system designed for continuous operation. The induced draft fan allows the material to be conveyed and collected in the product filter shown. When handling products with potential explosive, um, when handling products with potential for explosions, systems must employ more safety features. The most basic method of production is to provide the system with a way to vent pressure in the event of an, o an explosion. In this case, the product collector is shown with an explosion vent. All other components of the system are designed to withstand the overpressure generated during the explosion within the system. Vented systems must be designed to carry the flame and pressure front away from an occupied area. An alternative, is to this, an alternative is to design the system for containment, where all components are designed for full overpressure, 
generated during explosion and barrier valves are used to contain the pressure and flame front within the system. The barrier valves are shown here. The last system design we will discuss is the closed loop system. This is where the process gas is recirculated in the system and returned to the inlet of the mill. This type of system may be used for several reasons. Nitrogen can be used in an inert process for the elimination of the potential for an explosion or for eliminating moisture in the gas stream. Recirculation is used to conserve gas consumption and preserve energy. Due to the heat generated during the gr grinding, a heat exchanger is required to remove excess heat in the system. This concludes our presentation today on basic size reduction. I hope you found it informative and I thank you for your participation. I hope you will join us next month when we will present part two of basic size reduction where we will focus on fine grinding and micronization. Thank you. Now we begin our question and answer forum. As we are limited on time, we will try to accommodate all the questions, but apologize in advance if we are not able to answer all of them. If we are not able to address your question at this time, someone from Hosokawa will respond to you offline at a later date. The first question I have here. What is the capacity range of cone, cone mills? Uh, cone mills come in various size. Um, starting with the smallest unit, uh, they can probably handle as low as one kilogram an hour, uh, and very large units can handle several thousand kilograms per hour. Next question. For a hammer and, For a hammer and screen mill, is there a correlation, there a correlation between different size, size screens? Uh, over the years, most manufacturers have uh, developed empiri empirical information through um, testing, and through that they can determine the scale up of, of machines for both particle size and capacity. What is the, what is the basis of scale, scale up with any one of, one of the milling technologies? A, a, there are basically two parameters used for scale up um, when considering capacity scale-up scale is usually done on pounds per horsepower per hour. Uh, when scaling up for particle size, usually tip speeds and screen sizes, if, if they're employed, are also looked at uh, for scaling up particle size. In a liquid, In a liquid nitrogen, nitrogen hammer, hammer mill application, where is, where is the liquid nitrogen injected? The uh, nitrogen can be injected in a number of places. Uh, in, in systems employing uh, cryogenics, usually there is a pre-chilling tunnel that freezes the material, and then in standard hammer mills, nitrogen can be injected through the cover uh, to keep the internals of the uh, hammer mill at cold temperatures. My feed, my feed stack comes, comes off rail cars. Is there, is there a way to air convey my feed material directly into a hammer mill? Uh, that's potentially possible to do. The um, hammer mills can run under negative conditions, so you can convey materials to the mill. It's important to remember that uh, the mills operate typically under negative pressures, so it's important to keep the zero point in the mill either at zero or slightly negative when air conveying. When would, when would you use smooth liners? I think I mentioned it in the presentation, but smooth liners are incorporated for um, a couple of reasons. One is to produce uh, or g minimize the generation of fines. In other cases where materials tend to plug multiple deflector liners, they're used to help keep the internals of the mill clean. What is, the what is the particle size range of pin mills? The particle size range of pin mills is, qu is quite wide. Um, at low speeds, um, and no screens, you know, pin mills can generate a relatively coarse particle size distribution. And on the fine side, at very high speeds of up to 150 meters per second, they can produce particle sizes in the range of 50, mic 50 microns or less. For sterile, for sterile bulk, bulk APIs, APIs which, equipment which equipment model is best for powder processing? Uh, this depends on the... Um, requirements of the application, so finishes and uh, cleanability issues. 
Uh, but for those applications, the uh, universal pin mills we discussed are most commonly employed. When do you need to seal the inlet of a hammer mill? That normally hammer mills don't require sealing. Uh, the the system picture that we showed with the feed isolation valve is used when uh, potential explosion conditions are are encountered, and then an isolation valve is used to seal the inlet of the hammer mill. We have been, we have been using a micropulverizer for grinding sugar, and with the new regulations, we're looking for a pressure containment version. Is there, is there such a mill available? Uh, several manufacturers uh, make hammer mills that are designed for overpressure over situations. In my, in my business, business, I currently buy milled pigments, pigments and I'm looking to bring that process in-house. I, I believe the pigments are very fine particles, which are de-agglomerated. Agglomer de how do, I know, How do I know what kind of mill to use? Does the, Does the fact, fact that, that the particles are finer to begin with, perhaps, perhaps agglomerate, it make it easier to grind? This somewhat depends on material characteristics. Um, employing Van der Waals forces, some particles tend to agglomerate very tightly and may need higher energy to, um, to break them apart. Uh, the best recommendation I have is to um, do some tests with your equipment manufacturer to determine which equipment type is the most suitable. What are the, what are the advantages of a pin mill over a hammer mill for making, for making fine powders? This depends, I guess, on the uh, material characteristics that we talked about. Uh, again, as one example, uh, without the screen, uh, sticky materials are much easily processed without buildup inside of a pin mill. I have a, I have need, a need to grind recycled tire, tire rubber to 80 mesh. What kind of, what kind of grinder can be used to grind tire, tire rubber? rubber? Hammer and screen mills can be used to grind uh, rubber under cryogenic conditions. Uh, 80 mesh is a, is a very difficult particle size to achieve, but the combination of a cryogenic uh, hammer mill uh, in conjunction with a screening deck can produce 80 mesh material. How much, How much heat is generated with a pin mill, mill versus, versus a hammer and screen mill, mill? And which, is which is better for heat sensitive materials? Typically, high-speed hammer mills uh, generate more heat. So if, um, if you're selecting a mill, the best is to find a unit that can handle high air flows, uh, which will help dissipate heat and handle heat-sensitive materials uh, more effectively and efficiently. That concludes our question and answer forum. We at Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems sincerely thank you for your time and attention today. Please refer to our website, www.hmicronpowder.com, to view upcoming educational webinars, notably Part 2 of the Basics of Size Reduction, which will be conducted sometime in late June of 2009. If you have any further questions or requests, you may contact Rob or he's directly. His contact information is displayed here on the screen. One other note, this presentation will be posted on our website. So if you know of any colleagues who may be interested in viewing this or prior webinars, they may do so by accessing our website. Again, we thank you and good day.